We'll try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. Uh, real quickly, I, I just got a couple things I want to show you. This is our church. We have vacation Bible school starting Sunday night. Not tonight, but this next Sunday night. And this is our church. So if you would like a shirt, please tell Miss Tanya, my wife, before you leave here today, because today is the last day because we'll have to have them ready for Sunday when, when, when uh, VBS starts. And that's the front of them. Oh, uh, okay, Miss Becky, I'm sorry. F uh, following Jesus, the light of the world, hope, direction, love, power, courage. Right, yeah, thank you. Clap, please, yes. And uh, so these are $6.50. I dare you to find T-shirts any cheaper than that for a church event. And it's just a, a wonderful thing because, we're, you know, we're, we're getting them at, at the wholesale cost. And, and so that's just a blessing. So everyone can look the same. So when we invite all these children, everyone comes out to BBS, it looks so good. Um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, if you would, please. The book of Genesis, as you see on our, our PowerPoint here, happy Father's Day. I've got just a couple little things I want to read to you. I, I was able to find this thing called the Men's Thesaurus, uh, Brother Butch, and I, I know that uh, everyone will appreciate this, the Men's Thesaurus. And so I'm, I know that all you ladies are here just, just waiting to get your hands on a copy of the Men's Thesaurus to kind of kind of let you in on, uh, give you some insight in when we say something, what we're really meaning. Amen. Some women would like to know when my husband says something, I'd like to know what he really means by that. And so let me just mark out a few here that I think will be helpful to our congregation this morning for a little bit of humor. The men's thesaurus. Men don't always say what they mean. Ladies, please allow me to translate for you for future benefit. When a man says it would take too long to explain, what he really means is I have no idea how it works. <laughs> when a man says, uh, take a break, honey, you are working too hard, what he really means is, I can't hear the game over that vacuum cleaner. When a man says, well, that's interesting, dear, he really means, are you still talking? Not funny, don't laugh at that. Um, when, when a man says, well, it's a guy thing, he really means there is no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no choice at all of making it logical. Amen? You're not going to make it logical. When a man says, can I help with dinner, what he really means is, why isn't it ready yet? When a man says, uh... Uh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response. <laughs> Amen. Uh, all right. Um, when a man says, you know how bad my memory is, he really means I can remember the names and bios of every player on my favorite football team and the VIN number of every car I've ever owned. But yes, I did forget your birthday. Amen. Ain't that the truth, amen? Amen. All right, last but not least, <clears throat> when a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. He really means I have probably severed a limb, but I will bleed to death before I admit it, and so please get over here and help me. <laughs> amen. Let's give the men's the sorrows a hand. <laughs> That was, uh, that blessed my heart when I saw that. If you found your way to chapter 5 of the book of Genesis, look to verse 21. I'm going to touch on a few things. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, verses that I used last year during the Father's Day sermon. And uh, I believe it's just going to really open back up to us again this year because of some of the things we've been dealing with and what God's been laying on my hearts. So I want us to be ready uh, to hear God's Word. Are you ready to hear God's Word? Say amen. amen. Are you glad you came to God's house? Say amen. 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 Well, let's get started. Touchstone Publications did a survey on the family and church attendance, and the statistics are phenomenal. 
They found that if both mother and father attend church regularly, that 33% of their children would as well. That's pretty amazing, amen, that if mother and father both attend church, that 33% of their children will as well. <clears throat> if just the mother attended regularly, then only 2% of their children would be faithful in later life. Now, I want you to remember that number, 2%. If only the mother attends, statistics show that later on in life, that only 2% of the children will continue on in church. Now, if only dad, being his father's day, attended church on a regular basis, then a whopping 44% of their children would attend regularly as they got older. That's the statistics. So for mom by herself, 2%, which we see in this country that mamas bring their children to church more so most of the time, but not in all cases, than daddies do. Amen? And we see that, and the statistics don't lie. They say only 2% more or less of those children uh, will have the, the ability or that will come to church as they get older and not grow away. But if the man comes, if the dad comes, if the father comes into God's house, that 44% of those kids are more likely to come back to church, make it back to their walk with God, or to stay in church altogether. That is amazing. That is amazing because we see in this country that so many times mamas and grandmas bring the kids we see that, and I thank God for that, but that's not the way he set it up. It seems that dads have such an effect on their children that their loyalty to dad grew even if mom lacked in her efforts to go. Why, you might ask? <clears throat> because that's the way that God set it up. That's how he ordained the family, for the father to lead his household. Fathers have to be the leaders of the household. Fathers and mothers should all come to church. We understand that the kids, it should be a family affair. But the statistics show us that there's a great, great difference in when just mom does it or when just dad does it. And that's because that's the way that God set it up. Everything is for a reason in God's universe. Everything is planned. This universe is beautifully and perfectly put together by God, and he knows what he's doing. So as the fathers here this morning on this special day, let me just break a few things down for us <clears throat> that I believe will help show us how to do it the right way. And there again, I want to say happy Father's Day. If you made your way to the book of Genesis chapter 5, Verse 21, if you would please stand. <clears throat> As I read God's holy, perfect, and authoritative word. Verse 21 of chapter 5 of the book of Genesis, talking about Enoch. The word of God says this. And Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. We know that Enoch was translated. And by translated we mean he was just taken up by God. One day him and God was just walking around. He was walking with God. And the old joke is that they said, hey, uh, let's stop by the house. He says, well, mine's closer. Come on. And he just took Enoch with him. So Enoch was translated. But the, the fact that he says that he was 65 when he had his first child, Methuselah, it said then he walked with God, and he walked with God the rest of his life. And when we think about walking with God as fathers, we need to think about this seriously of what our lives look at. Do our lives look like a life that would be characterized as someone who walks with God? Do you walk with God this morning? And this is going to the fathers, but it goes to everyone as well in general. Are we walking with God 
the way that we should. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, Father God, for having us here this morning on this wonderful day, this wonderful occasion, Father. We celebrate Mother's Day, and now we get to celebrate Father's Day, Father. Lord God, we thank you because we call you Father. We reach to you as, as Father God. Lord God, you have set this universe in motion in a particular way, and we are not to mess with it. We are to walk with you. We are to follow you, Father. Lord God, I thank you for all of these fathers who are here this morning, young and old alike. Lord God, let us hear your word this morning. Let us not hear the orator. Let us not hear necessarily the preacher. Let me stand in behind the cross, Father, and let your words shine through here this morning. Father, if there be any spirit in here that has walked through these doors, that is a contrite spirit, a spirit that is something other than holy, a spirit that is not here to welcome you, not here to uplift you, Father God, I would ask you to bind it. Bind it right now, Father God, and break the hearts of those, Lord God, and let them understand who you are and to see your glory here this morning. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be <clears throat> seated. I'll try to keep my voice going here this morning. Number one, if you like to take notes, write this down. Walking with God means to go in God's direction. How many of us understand that when you walk with God or with anyone, you walk in their direction? So walking in God and walking with God means that we must go in God's direction. He is the leader. He is the guide. And God should be our compass on a daily basis. Amen. How many of you have a GPS system in your car? Raise your hand. How many of you can find new places without it? Raise your hand. Amen. All right. God should be your compass in life. How many of you, how many of you realize that you do not know what tomorrow holds for you? Raise your hand. You do not know what tomorrow holds for you. But guess what? God does. Amen. And so if we allow God to be our compass, if we follow God and everything that he leads us into, then we'll never be wrong and we'll never go wrong. <clears throat> Nextly, I want you to look at this real quickly. Not the direction of those around me either who are not following God. And I was thinking about this this morning. <clears throat> we all have people in our lives that do not follow Jesus Christ. Amen? We do. Even if they're saved, even if they go to church, we have people in our life that just are not on track with God where they should be. And if we are trying to walk with God, then we do not need to be trying to follow those who are around us. Amen? Amen? We need to be following God and not those who are around us. I've got friends... <clears throat> who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and I'm not going to debate it with them. But they will tell me things that they believe are okay to do that I know for a fact that my God does not want me to do. Amen? And so I have to realize that God is my compass, not my friends around me. They are not my compass. They are the, not the ones that have to answer for me one day. They are not the ones that I'm trying to follow. I'm trying to follow my God more closely. I'm trying to walk with God in his direction, not those who are around me. And also, I'm not trying to go in the direction that my flesh wants to go. How many of us realize that your body, your desires, your flesh, and your mind will most of the time, many of the time, sometimes all the time, will lead you away from the things that God wants you to do? Can I get an amen? amen. Our flesh is deceitful. Our flesh is devious. Our flesh will tell us, hey, this is okay. Just one time is fine. Don't worry about this. God will forgive you. Go right on ahead. We need to understand that we cannot 
follow the direction of our flesh just because we think that it will feel good or that it's not going to hurt anyone in particular. God says, if you're going to follow me, then you need to turn away from your old ways, turn away from your fleshly desires, and worship me alone. Can I get an amen? God wants us to follow him and only him <clears throat> and not to be self-serving. Most of you are probably just like myself. We all have tendencies to serve ourselves, whether it's your money. Big time, I, I tell people this all the time. I can, I can tell you where your heart is if you'll let me look at your banking statement just for a moment. I can look at your debit card statement and tell you where your heart's at, what you spend your money on, right? And so we need to find out, we need to ask ourselves, are we following our desires? Are we following our flesh? Are we doing the things that our flesh wants? Or are we truly trying to live a life separated from the world and on track with Jesus Christ? It's not an easy thing to do, guys. It's, it's not simple, even as a pastor, maybe especially as a pastor. It's very hard to put away wants, desires, fleshly yearnings, whatever the case, and stay on track with God. But if we're going to follow God, we've got to turn away from ourselves. Amen? They, how many of you know they can't be two bosses at work? How many of you know they ain't two bosses at home? Amen? Thought you'd like that. There can't be two bosses at work. There's got to be one boss, right? There's one boss. Either you're going to be boss or God's going to be boss. Either you're going to follow what you want to do or you're going to follow what God wants to do. But if you follow what you want to do, then you're not following God. Verse 22 states this as we read, And Enoch walked with God. Now, there are three other profound statements in the Word of God about Enoch that apply here, and I want us to see these. First, the one we just saw, Genesis 5, 22, Enoch walked with God. The second one is Jude 14, and it says, he witnessed for God. Enoch followed God, and in Jude it says, Enoch witnessed for God. And thirdly, Hebrews eleven five 5 says, <clears throat> Enoch pleased God. So Enoch walked with God. Enoch witnessed for God. And Enoch pleased God. How many of you can stand here this morning and say, if someone was characterizing your life like the Word of God does for Enoch, would say that he lived for God, that he walked for God, and that he pleased to God this morning? You see, I think that <clears throat> most of us would like to believe that maybe we're on track for that or, or maybe that, hey, listen, I'm not perfect, I'm not Enoch, or, or I'm not Abraham, or I'm not Moses, or whoever. No, you're you, and they were them. But you're just as important as they were. And God needs you to follow him just as close as they did. They are our examples. They are not out of reach. They're not people that we're supposed to say, well, that's out of reach. That's what the great saints did. The Bible calls you saints if you're bought by the blood in here this morning. You're considered to be a saint. We should want these three statements to be true about us as well. If not, we will find ourselves living in sin. Are you walking with God? If you're not walking with God, who are you walking with? Your friends? Your flesh? Your personal desires? If you're not walking with God on a daily basis, then that means you're walking with yourself on a daily basis. And if you're doing that, then you're sinning, baby. You're living a life characterized by sin. There's no in-between, brothers and sisters. I like it when people say, well, they're riding that fence. There ain't no such thing as a fence. you either living for God or you're living for yourself. You're either righteous or you're sinful. Amen? Not my words. 
his words. How would your life be characterized? The essence of sin, let's look at that, is choosing to go your own way and doing your own thing rather than what God wants you to do. That's the essence of sin. Why do people sin? Think of whatever sin in your head that you can conjure up. And say, now, well, what does that sin mean? What, how does that sin come about? What makes that a sin? It makes it a sin because God says don't do it, and you do it anyway. Right? You're living a life that is not following God. You're following yourself. You're following your own desires. You're listening to what somebody at work tells you. You're listening to what somebody at the gym tells you. You're listening to what someone on the playground tells you. Whatever the case, someone at school tells you. But you're not listening to God. That's the essence of sin. That's what makes sin up. Doing things your own way, doing your own thing rather than doing what God wants you to do. Isaiah 53, 6, and you can make a side note, <clears throat> states this. We are like sheep that have gone astray. Let me tell you about this. Sheep that have gone astray in, in the, in the uh, Bible, in the days when the shepherd would have the sheep out, a sheep would go astray and go up on the side of the mountain hill or on the side of the hill. Wouldn't be far, but he'd be just far enough that he would be gone astray. Many things can happen when the sheep gets away from the flock. Amen? Come on, amen? I know you're catching on to this. Many things can happen when the sheep get away from the flock. The shepherd's in charge of the flock. The flock's walking together. And then a sheep has gone astray. We have turned to the ways of our own flesh, the Bible says. <clears throat> the sheep goes up on the hill for a couple different reasons. He sees something up there he wants to eat. You know, sheep are the dumbest animals there is, right? Right? And the Bible calls us sheep, amen? Okay, there's a reason for that. So a sheep sees something on the hillside that he likes. Maybe it's green grass. He thinks that the grass is greener on the other side of this line that the shepherd is walking with the rest of the flock. And so he finds himself going astray from the rest of the flock to go after his own sheeply desires. Now, but praise God because the rest of the scripture says this, and the Lord has laid on him our sins. As we can stray away, as we can follow our fleshly desires, thank God, praise God, there is one who came to bear our burdens. Praise God, there is one who took our penalty of the cross. Praise God that his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Give him praise. <clears throat> we have a God that loves us. We have a God that wants to always keep us on track. We have a God that wants to keep us within the flock. You know, it just, it blessed my heart when I was reading that because it's, it's very humbling to me to know that I am the under-shepherd of a flock. That's what we are. We're all sheep in God's kingdom. And I'm an under-shepherd of this flock. And sometimes flock find themselves or sheep find themselves going astray from the flock. And when they do, it's usually because their fleshly or personal desires have them wanting something that is going to not necessarily coincide with what church is all about. Well, I want to sleep in, preacher. I get up all week long at 4 a.m. I can make it to, to work on time, but I'll tell you what, 10 o'clock's rough, brother. Hey, man, I've heard that one. <clears throat> well, preacher, Sundays is the only day I get off. So usually I just want to sleep in and do my own thing. I've heard that one. Well, preacher, Sundays is the big day that we all go fishing. That's the big tournament days. I've heard that one. Preacher Sundays is the only time that we can take rides to the mountains with the family. I like family stuff. 
God likes family stuff, but not in place of his word in his house all the time. We all have excuses, and we all come up with different excuses. But God took our penalty for us. We find ourselves following our flesh instead of following what God's Word tells us to do. If we continue on a path following our own flesh and not following what God would tell us to do, the essence of sin is not following God. So you might think to yourself, well, I'm not a sinner because I try to live a good life. Are you doing what God wants you to do? If we're not doing what God wants us to do, then we're sinning. We're living a sinful life. So however you want to look at it, now we're all sinners and falling short, but there's a big difference between habitual sin, meaning that you wake up today and you know that you're going to sin and you're okay with it, and sin that just happens throughout the day. When Enoch was born, he was born into sin just as we are. But something happened that pulled him toward God and away from his self. Something happened. And so the Bible don't give us a lot of information about Enoch. It don't give us tons of, of in-depth information like it does Abraham or about Moses. But something caused him to turn to God and away from self. Could it have been the birth of his son? It says that Enoch was 65 years old when he begat Methuselah. And then the next words were, and he walked with God. Maybe it was the birth of a child. I've talked to people this week who told me that when their granddaughter was born or when their daughter was born, they, they put the, the drinking away, they put the cussing away. They didn't want to have that around their kid or around their grandkid. And they said, well, you know, I, I grew up in church and, and I need to get back and, and that helped me and that caused it and that whatever the case. Well, let me just tell you now, God caused it. There might have been an event in your life that, that made you kind of start to see the light. But God draws us. And so Enoch had something possibly in his life that caused that. As I said, verse 21 says, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. Suddenly, he had responsibility if we're going to go with this argument. Suddenly, he had someone who looked up to him and to follow in his footsteps. Fathers, no matter how old you are, your kids will always look up to you. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how old they are. You might get so old they don't think you know much, but you'll never get too old where they don't look up to you. Your kids are always going to look up to you. So maybe, maybe Methuselah, or maybe Enoch was thinking this about Methuselah, that maybe my kid's going to always look up to me. Maybe, maybe I should be walking with God. He was going in his own direction, but he turned around and headed in a different way. He headed toward Calvary. Which way is your life headed this morning? Fathers, which way is your life headed today? Is your life on a crash course with self-indulgence? Is everything about me, me, me? What can I do for me? Even though you might think that you're doing things for your family, step back and take a look. There's only one person who can make sure that you're living the life that you need to live for your wife, living the life that you need to live for your kids, living the life that you need to live for your work, and his name is Jesus Christ. I tell people all the time that I counsel with, you cannot love your wife as much as she needs to be loved. You cannot love your kids as much as they need to be loved. You cannot put in the passion and the desire at the workplace of the people who pay you money to come in every day the way that you should. Only Jesus Christ can balance that equation. He's the only one. How in the world, why in the world do you think that so many marriages have trouble when people are all about the kids? 
and they forget about the husband and wife thing. Or they're all about the husband and wife thing and they forget about the kids. The kids grow up estranged from their parents, run off, act wild, act crazy. You say, well, I can't do it all. I work 20 hours a day and, and I got a wife and four kids. No, you can't, but Christ can. We have to get our priorities straight. It's such a blessing to deal with men on Father's Day about these things because as I said in the beginning, 44%. 44% of kids will stay in church if the dad is the one leading the way to the door. Why? Because that's the way God intended it. He didn't intend for the mama to be in charge. He didn't intend for the mama to get them kids up every day, run them out the door, and daddy lay in the bed, or daddy go fishing, or daddy go hunting, or, or whatever. He didn't intend for grandma or grandpa to do it. He intended for the fathers to lead the household. Not with a foot on mama's back, but with a hand underneath lifting her up. You let your kids see that. You let your kids see daddy lifting mama up and daddy leading the charge to the cross. See what happens. See what happens in the family dynamics. We call that repentance when we turn from one thing and head to Calvary. Repentance is changing the way that we walk. I was walking towards sin, but now I'm walking away from sin, and now I'm walking toward Christ and his cross. What's the first thing that we have to do or that we tell someone who's wanting to come to Christ, who's wanting to be saved, they feel the drawing of the Holy Ghost of God on their lives through the preaching or through the teaching. And we say the first thing you do is you repent. You repent. It does no good to say, okay, God, save me. I'm going to keep living like I want to. I'm going to keep doing everything I've been doing, but I want to be saved. It doesn't work like that. Repentance. There must be repentance before there can be reconciliation. Right? We have to repent of our sins. Let God know that we're sorry because the Holy Ghost has crushed our hearts. Maybe this morning, you're feeling that in here this morning maybe. Maybe you feel God calling you and you, you feel him laying a, a burden down upon your shoulders. Whether you're saved or not, maybe you're saved and you still got these burdens. Maybe you hadn't been living right, you hadn't been doing right, you hadn't been acting right. And God's laying these burdens. The Holy Ghost of God is laying these burdens on your shoulder. Here this morning, he's leading you to a place of repentance so you can be reconciled unto the throne of God. That's the way he's leading you. That's what he wants from all of us. How are you living your life? Are you pleasing God? Are you walking with God? Are you witnessing for God? John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Common verse. Most people know this verse. But do you understand this verse? The only way to the Father in heaven is through the Son now. Once you walk out this door, once an accident takes place, it's too late. It's too late. The only way to the Father is through the Son. If we want to be good fathers, if we want to be good husbands, if we want to be good role models for our kids, we must First, change the direction of our lives. Some of you are <clears throat> fathers to be. Some of you are fathers that's been fathers for a long time. The first way, the, the, the starting gate, is changing the direction of your lives to look more like Jesus. Well, preacher, that sounds like that's pretty hard to do. It's not easy. But with him, 
all things are possible. That's how we're supposed to do it. We can't trust in ourselves. Ourselves will lead us back into fleshly despair. But Jesus Christ will lead us into the gates of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus Christ will lead us where we need to go. Lastly, <clears throat> write this down. My voice has about had it, guys. Well, thank God, preacher. Walking with God means to live by faith. Real quickly, faith that God is a rewarder to those who seek him. Or another way of saying that is to say faith that God exists and that God is good. You got to have faith. <clears throat> you got to have faith that God is who he says he is and that God is good. Do you have faith this morning that God is the God of the universe, that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cruel Roman cross 2,000 years ago, that he died, was put in a tomb, raised again on the third day, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father on high. You've got to have faith in that. And if you do, and the Holy Ghost is drawing you, baby, today is the day of salvation. <clears throat> Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of reconciliation. Today is the day of repentance. Today is the day of life changing. Ten years ago, 11 years ago now, had a life changing experience with Jesus Christ. I've been around him my whole life. My grandfather was a Baptist minister. I'd known about Jesus my whole life. 45 years old, but 11 years ago, broke down in the basement floor of my mom and dad's house and asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And from that day on, baby, everything changed. If there hasn't been a change in your life, I would ask you to check your salvation. If there hasn't been a change in your life, I would ask you to come to this altar. There has to be a change. I saw a, a great article one time about uh, a guy was writing about people who's never drank, never smoked, never cussed, <clears throat> ain't never cheated on their wife. To most Christians, that's the big things, right? These were all the things I, that God took out of my life, amen? Drinking, drugs, running around. That's how I was living my life. He took the, what about somebody who don't do those things? Talk to those people, they say, a change takes place in your life. Don't matter how good you think you are. When the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart, everything changes. I have friends that say, well, really what you're saying is, Jay, that as you grow up, you just get more mature and you decide to quit all those things. No, I enjoyed drinking. I loved cussing. I've told you all that. I loved doing drugs. They were great, right? God is better. I didn't want to quit none of those things. But Jesus Christ and his burdensome love for me weighed down on me and said, today's the day. You want to keep running? I'm not going to call on you much anymore. You better make a decision. And I made a decision in that basement floor, on that cold brick floor that night. I made a decision for God. Fathers, we have to make a decision if we're going to lead our households. Are you going to be the leader of your house? Are you going to make sure that your kids are in church? If you've got to work, I understand. Are you going to make sure those kids are in church? You're going to be the leader. You're going to be the example. So even if you're not there, they know that their butts better be. We have too many parents today letting kids run the house. I don't want to go to church today. I don't care. I'm going to church Mama's going to church, and you and baby going to church too, amen? I love those preachers who say that they had a drug problem growing up. Mom and daddy drug them to church every time the doors were open. Had a drug problem, getting drugged to church. <clears throat> Fathers, this is your time here this morning. Today is the day for you to change everything. For anybody else in this congregation, it's your day too. 
But man, I, I have a passion for men. Men, you are the leaders of your house. Men, you are the ones who can make the difference. Men, you're the 44%. You're the change maker. And there's going to be blood on our hands if we're not the ones opening the door for our families on Sunday mornings. There's coming a day of reckoning. If you're saved, you won't be at the great white throne of judgment. But listen to me, judgment day is coming and you've got to answer for it you'll answer for the times that you walk by people and God told you to witness to them and you'll definitely answer for the times that you did not lead your family into righteousness amen amen, amen. amen. let us pray dear heavenly father